vector spaces, we're going to, what's this all about is that we're going to take a few objects you know very well, like n tuples of numbers, complex or real numbers, functions, polynomials, matrices. We're going to take these objects, we're going to look at them from unified angle, and we're going to single out or filter out the set of minimal properties which are common for these objects. And this set of minimal properties, we will abstractly call them vector spaces. So if you look at all of those objects, and we're going to look at them with more details a bit later, people look at that, mathematicians look at those objects, and they single out the following properties. Every time you deal with these objects, you sort of dealing with a quadruple of this type, where V, V stands for some non-empty set of something, if it is n-tuples, it's a set of n-tuples. If it is polynomials, it's a set of polynomials. If it is functions, it's a set of functions. And the elements of, of this set we're going to call them vectors, even though many of, them have, many of them have nothing to do with vectors whatsoever, like matrices, for instance. They are not vectors at all. You equip this with the f, which f, where f normally either, uh, either three of these, either... Um, rational numbers, real or complex, more often it's either real or complex numbers, and these two, they appear very often interchangeably. Some results, many results are valid for both or for three of these. Some of them are valid for some, either real or complex. The elements of this F field, we call them scalars, and this F stands for field. F stands for field. Now. These are the two elements of my quadruple. V is a non-empty set. F is this field of scalars, rationals, uh, reals, or complex. Plus and dot, or in your yellow book, actually, uh, it is used asterisk, but I like dot more than the asterisk. These are the sort of mappings, which we call the addition operation, and the scaling operation. So my notation here, and I'm not sure why this is not quoted, so it's a term. Uh, my notation here says that plus takes two elements from V and returns a new element from V. So you can think of it as a black box where you, uh, where you feed in two elements of your V, two vectors, and the black box spits out another vector. And dot operation, that's the one which is fed with the one scalar and one vector, and spits out one new vector. Now, this is not it, of course. Uh, before we can call this quadruple a vector space, we have to put this operation subject to some axioms. And like I said, the, these axioms which I'm about to present, this is a quite substantial joint effort of many mathematicians who observed lots of these examples of vector spaces. Regular vectors, three-dimensional vectors, and tuples of numbers, matrices, functions, there are many other examples, solutions to differential equations, solutions to different equations we discussed with you two days ago. They observed all of this object, and by just doing some serious work, they refined these 10 axioms, which I'm about to present, which are shared between all of these examples of vector spaces. Here they are. Uh, so in my, in my presentation of axioms, I'm going to use the following notations, U, V, W, with the arrows above it, it will be the elements of my vector space. They are vectors. And Greek letters, like lambda and mu, I will use for the scalars. In yellow book, in yellow book, actually, there is, a, there is a little bit different convention for writing the vectors. In yellow book, they use the bold face for symbols they use to denote vectors. So they, if I use the yellow book notation, I will, I will write something like this, like this something like this, but I'm avoiding using the boldface because if you copy my notes in your notebooks, it's hard to reproduce the boldface with your hand and the pen, but it's easier to reproduce an arrow above the symbol, and that's why I use the arrow notation. Some people actually in your tutorials, if, you, if you've done any vectors in your tutorial, tutorials, or you will, done, you will do it later on, some people here who solve questions with vectors, they use to emphasize the boldface, they put the uh, the little underscore under the letter. That's another way to emphasize the bold face and emphasize the vector. So here's the axioms. First one, it says 
uh, it says if you add two vectors, you will end up with the vector itself. We normally call this axiom closed under addition. Closed under addition axiom. Strictly speaking, this is a pseudo axiom because it's already said here in my definition of the plus mapping. It says here we take two vectors and we return a vector. So basically this is a repetition of what is said here. That's why I call it a pseudo axiom. And if it was up to me, I wouldn't list it at all. But I list it because in yellow book this axiom is listed. I don't, I don't want to give you different numbering of the axioms different to the yellow book. But this is effectively, this is not an axiom. It is just it, because it is said here. Second one says, this is the associative law of addition. It says that if you, you can add three vectors in any way you wish. You can add the first two first and then add the third one to it. Or you can do, you can add up the second and the third first and then add the first one to it. We call it the associative law. It of addition. Third one, it's the commutative law. It says you can add vectors in any order. You can add either u plus v or v plus u, and that will not alter the result. That's the law which is called the commutative, which is called the commutative law. The fourth one, the fourth one, it's the one which says, uh, which is called the existence of the zero vector, and it says, in your vector space, before you will be able, before you will be allowed to call the vector space, there should be a special vector. And we reserve a special notation for that special vector, zero vector, zero in a bold face, or zero with the arrow, or zero with the underscore. All three notations are equivalent. And this vector is distinguished by the following property. If you add this vector to any other vector, v, like this, the result will not change. And that is true for any vector from your vector space v. If this is so, we say that there is a zero vector, and that's the axiom which is called existence of zero vector. The fifth one, it's another existence axiom. It says it's, it is existence of the negative, and it says for any vector, for any vector in your vector space, there must be another vector attached to it, which we call the negative of V. And its negative is distinguished by the following property. If you add this negative to your initial vector, you will end up with zero. This is the axiom which is called the existence of negative. And you see, I put the quotes around the terms because that's the definition of those terms. That's why I put the quotes around the terms because that's, that's how we define the negative. That's, this is the distinguished property which defines the negative vector. This five, this set of five axioms, that's the set which is relevant uh, solely to the, addition, to the addition operation. Now, the second operation, scaling, it has its own axioms. The sixth one in the yellow book, it's another pseudo axiom. Uh, and in, this, in, in my writing of this axiom, actually, I'm, I'm showing you that I will use the two different ways of writing the scaling. Uh, when I want to make it explicit, I will use dot, like this. If it's not so important to make it explicit, I will just skip the dot altogether, and that's two different notations for the scaling. But the axiom itself says that the vector space is closed under scaling. Again, it's a pseudo axiom. In the same way, this one is a pseudo axiom because it's, it, it is said already here that scaling takes a couple of scalar and a vector as a black box and spits out the element of V. It is said here. So this is, again, I kept this just to preserve the numbering consistent with the yellow book. But this is a pseudo axiom, but it still has a name. Closed under scaling. That's the name for this axiom. Uh, we have another axiom which is uh, totally in relation of the scaling alone. It's called the associative law of scaling. Here it is. It's like this. Uh, which means you can put brackets again in a different order when you scale a vector with two different numbers, two different scalars. 
uh, I draw your attention to the fact here that even though my writing, for instance, here and here looks very much alike, in principle, essentially, there are two different multiplications there, two different scaling. This is a multiplication between numbers, either rational, surreal, or complex numbers, whereas this is a scaling, even though it looks the same, the nature of these two operations is totally different. This one is called the associative law of scaling. Associative law of scaling. And, I uh, know, actually we still have another one which is, again, only related to uh, to scaling. There is a, if you scale a vector with a special number in your scalar field with a unity, the vector will not change, and that is true for every vector. It's another axiom. And finally, the last two, the axiom number 9 and the axiom number 10, they actually connect two operations together. These are the two distributive laws. One of them is called the distributive, the scalar distributive law. It's, it looks like this. If you multiply a vector with the sum of two scalars, you can do it like this instead. Again, I draw your attention to the fact, even though I use the same symbol plus and the same symbol plus here, these are two different pluses. The plus on the left-hand side, it's the numerical plus between the numbers. The plus on the right-hand side, it's a totally, it's, it's a plus between the vectors. It may be very different from the plus between the numbers. There are, there are questions in the yellow book which, which actually emphasize that very clearly. Unfortunately, I don't have it today, but maybe next time I'll, I'll do one of these. This is called the scalar distributive law. Uh, and the last one, the tenth one, it's the vector distributive law. This time, you have plus between the vectors, like this. And again, the axiom says that you can do it in a different way, and that's that's the vector distributive law. This time, of course, this plus and this plus, they are identical pluses. Both of them pluses between the vectors. Uh, any questions?